This is the recent interview with Nick Gillespie. Today's episode is sponsored by Bank on Yourself. My guest today, and I'm incredibly excited about this, is Nick Cave, the music legend I've been listening to since he emerged from Australia in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Over the years, Nick Cave has written screenplays, soundtracks, novels. He's collaborated with everyone from Johnny Cash to Kylie Minogue to PJ Harvey to Neko Case. Since 2018, he's published The Red Hand Files, where he answers readers' questions in a manner that is deeply vulnerable, touching, and insightful. He's got a new album out with his longtime band, The Bad Seeds. It's called Wild God. We talk about this astonishing record, along with his unshakable commitments to free speech, how the death of his 15-year-old son affected his art, his abiding interest in ritual and religion, and why he refuses to join artist boycotts of countries such as Israel. Today's episode is sponsored by The Dispatch, your source for unbiased news and commentary informed by conservative principles. Is Donald Trump really going to jail? Does Joe Biden really have what it takes for a second term? Do these questions even matter in the 2024 U.S. election? Get past the bluster and get back to the facts by joining The Dispatch. The Dispatch provides original reporting and commentary on politics, policy, and culture, and it's all informed by conservative principles. Their newsletters and podcasts offer fact-based analysis to help members make sense of the biggest domestic and international stories of the day. The Dispatch has created a home for the politically homeless and provides a needed and welcome sense of humor as their writers explain the news. Reason listeners can try an exclusive 30-day free trial membership. Just click the link in the show notes to join the Dispatch today. Here is the Reason interview with Nick Cave. Let's talk uh, first about your uh, forthcoming album or the yeah. new album, Wild God. Um, can, what, can I ask you something before we yeah. do? Do you normally do? I, I've, I've listened to a lot of Reason. Okay. Um, but I've never heard a kind of celebrity style music thing. Do, do, do you normally do that? Oh, uh, what do you mean? Like, well, you know, I've heard a lot of politics yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and so forth. Egghead but, intellectuals. Well, sometimes. you know, that, that kind of thing, but, uh, but not, uh, not so much, um, you know, music orientated stuff. And that, if I just got that wrong. Or? Yeah. I mean, I've, uh, I'm I've, concerned for your audience. No, no. Uh, you know, I, I'm just thinking in the past couple of years, uh, we've talked to Frank Portman of, uh, the Mr. T experience, the West coast post punk band, uh, Frank Turner, Okay, so, 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 so we're, yeah. not, we're not out on a limb here on our own. Oh, no, not at all. And, and actually, I mean, this is, you know, in a way, I've been a, a, I've listened to you, you know, since I was a lad, and I'm, I'm a few years younger than you, but th what you, what's emerged over the past, what, six years, seven years, um, uh, particularly the Red Hand Files, this is one of the things I'm most interested in talking with you oh, about, really? okay. is both the content of that, what you're writing about, but also the fact of it. Um, you know, you are a, you know, you're a rock musician who talks, uh, who channels a lot of kind of religious ecstasy and agony. Um, and yet here you are, instead of being a distant Jesus, you know, instead of being uh, Jim Morrison, <laughs> way, way off in the Hollywood Bowl, away from people, you are intermingling with your audience in a, in a very direct, barely mediated way. And so I find that, in general, one of the most interesting things, developments of the past 40 years, um, the way uh, everything has become more leveled. Um, and so producer and consumer are in more of a conversation, and I think you're making that explicit. Does that make any sense to you? You, you mean that, that everything's become more leveled in, in our culture? Yeah. yeah. That the, you know, yeah. that the, um, it's, it's harder for, uh, you know, an authority and that could be a politician. It could be a businessman. It could be a rock star. It could be a priest to stand apart from their crowd or from their audience. Like everybody is more in a mix now. Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny. I mean, I don't know if this, it all answers your question, but what I wanted to do initially, because I, I, I sort of discovered, I think, the 
idea of the podcast right. uh, years ago, mm-hmm. you know, back with early Joe Rogan and, mm-hmm. and, and that sort of stuff, that, that lovely idea that, that he, I guess, he stumbled upon, which mm-hmm. was that people were, were happy to listen to three-hour yep. conversations, right. you know, that people, people's attention span actually wasn't small like right. everyone thought. And this was sort of a, a radical thing, and 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 I kind of had an urge, you know. My, my son had died, yeah. and and I'd received a lot of um, letters to, from people who, who a similar thing had happened, mm-hmm. and they were very helpful to me. And I felt, look, I, I can speak about this stuff, and and maybe I could do a podcast. But the more I thought, I even sent my assistant, my long-suffering assistant, off to learn. <laughs> learn about podcasts right. right she she did like a podcast course but by the time she finished the course i decided that that the podcast just wasn't for me that i didn't yeah. that it was too it was too revealing mm-hmm. and it was too there was little control there was too little control right. i think I, I was just worried about about how much i had no control over how much i, I could give away mm-hmm. um and so, I, so I, I just decided that I would do a, a, a this sort of small idea, really, which was an "ask me anything" kind right. of agony aunt yeah. type of thing. I just you no, know, the, actually, the agony aunt thing came a little bit later. But it was right. first; it was just an "ask me anything" in the back of my mind, hoping people would ask me interesting things. Yeah. Now, initially, people just asked. What's your you know favorite Dylan song and, right. and kind of music stuff, but I gradually expanded it outwards yeah. to include all sorts of different things. And now, I don't know, it was six years later or something like that, it has become the central sort of pillar mm. from from which everything I do kind of rev- revolves around. Yeah, and I've heard you you spend like three days a week. Audit, that's right. right. So that, that's and you yeah, just I mean, passed it, uh, in July. You you said that you had received your hundred thousandth question. Yeah. So I mean, oh, and so this, all of all of which I've read. Yeah. But you know, I I just feel I feel by doing this, and you mm-hmm. must know this yourself. I, I feel um, inextricably connected to people, and not just through. Not just through the sort of trauma of losing my son, which was certainly that, but by just being inundated by right. the sort of river of of um, sorrow and yeah. meaning and stuff that comes through the red hand files. It's mm. just this extraordinary thing, and and it, it can't help but change you. Well, you and know. you can appreciate, I'm sure. The you know that energy that it gives back to an audience to have a connection and you know it's not on some level it's not real but it's authentic and it, it certainly is very meaningful. But I was thinking about it in in terms of you know I I, I uh, I'm sixty one so I was born in sixty three. I started listening to music in the mid seventies and I had a hippie uncle who gave me a bunch of sixties records. And there were like a couple of bird songs on it. And I was like, oh, I like that sound. And then I was like, who are these guys? And this was in the late 70s. There was no way to find out. Yeah, and no, there was no information on the records. Um, I couldn't ask anybody because nobody was a hippie anymore. And I went to the library and there was like nothing. The The band members' names were misspelled depending on the album and things <laughs> like that. And we live in this rich world now, right? Where you can actually not and not everybody who is a is a known creative force does this, but it's an incredible act of generosity to people to listen to what they're talking about and engage them on their level, I think. Yeah, I mean, I mean look, we we have all this information at our fingertips, but I think there there there's there is social media. Um, that is that is very different. I think the red hand files yeah. aren't social right. media. Um, the, the the general temperature is completely different. Yeah. Uh, it's funny because I do get people who are pissed off at something I might have said about something or other, right. and and they use the sort of la- the, the language the, the, of outrage that you get on social media. And these questions just sort of 
reverberate. You can right. see them sticking out of the yeah. all the all this beautiful river, sort of river of feeling coming yeah. through, and just these nasty little yeah. uh, letters about whatever whatever the thing might be. Um, but I, I, I just you, you can't you can't not be you, you can't not feel a part of something mm-hmm. uh, on a deep level uh, doing this sort of thing um, in a way that I don't think you do when you're on Twitter or right you know it's just it's just a whole different whole different thing. So. Is it um, you, you know part I mean as you're saying you know the red hand files it's not unmediated it's not everything that you believe all the time you know and and you're you, you know you're um, taking certain letters and answering them, and you're you're in a role when you're doing that. But it's different. Your career, in a lot of ways, and I think about this in terms of you know it, your career, like uh, somebody like uh, David Bowie's or Bob Dylan's. You go, th- you've gone through different kind of yeah. persona, um, and we're always enacting that. But this seems like you, one of the main arcs of your career has been to become less guarded and less um you know kind of limited in the way that you yeah. you present to an audience um is that partly uh, you know is that artistic growth is it you know just getting older is it being more mature is it being through you know you've been through an incredible blender in terms of loss over you know many years but especially over the past decade or so yeah um look when 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 what I, you know, I discovered a lot when that, when, 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 when my son died, and and you, you obviously you change, but you know what, what I saw that I cultivated to some mm-hmm. degree before that was to be an outsider, right. to live outside the world, to 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 have a sort of slightly jaundiced view of right. existence and. And a kind of default setting of mild contempt for everything, mm-hmm. and 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 live outside the world to be alien from the world. And I, I think when these things happen to you, you can't help mm-hmm. but be um, drawn in to 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 the world. You you suddenly realise you're not an outsider; you're an insider. Right. You're within the world. And I I felt that it was necessary. For me to, it, it wasn't like a conceit. It was just a need for me to contact or connect with with these with these people mm-hmm. on some kind of level. Um, and I didn't want to sit and do conversations. I didn't. I right. didn't want to do that. I, I just felt that I could answer people's questions in a cautious, considered, compassionate way. Right. That it might. Go some way of ameliorating their, their you know, various sorrows right. about things, and it it has you know, and and it's helped me a lot too. And you know, I I I often look at it in that I think before this happened to me, and this this thing that happens to us all, I was a partially formed human mm-hmm. being i think that's what we are as as young people mm-hmm. we're not fully fully formed uh, and it takes a kind of devastation to complete us as human beings mm-hmm. and i and i felt <laughs> once i'd become more complete i felt that i also became more adept at being able to um ha- have something to say for other people's you know in a sorrow in a uh uh, an edition of the Red Hand Files, uh, in an entry, I think, from uh, July, you talked about how our humanness is not given to us. It's something that we're constantly constructing and creating. I mean, that's what Yeah, you're that's exactly about, what right? I'm talking about. Yeah. And I guess, you know, the challenge then is how do, you, how do you live with that? Because it's hard, right? I mean, the pain is unbearable um, in many ways. But if you if you don't live in the world of tragedy and despair, then you, you're, you're shrinking away and you're pulling yourself out of the world. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a, de- there's a decision to be made um, when something like this happens. 
ultimately, I mean, you can't make these decisions when you're sort of deep in it, but ultimately you either, um, you either, uh, and there's a sort of heroicness about this or sort of nobility about this is to sort of turn inward and sort of wrap yourself around the absence of the person that mm -hmm. you've lost. And that's, that's your world. And this is a dark and dangerous place as far as I'm concerned. And I know people who are in that place that, that it's, it's a, a fucking outrage to suggest that you can be happy right. um, after something like this. And I, I feel that I felt that I had to make a conscious decision to turn outwards and look at the world. Mm. And, and what I saw was myself reflected in the world. I saw my own brokenness mm. reflected in everybody in a way. It was a cosmic experience. It was a religious experience in the sense that that uh, of of uh, of a movement from one thing to another thing right. and I, I mean it was a religious experience like i found jesus or something right. i just found myself deeply connected to other people and that i i saw myself reflected in other people mm. and them reflected in me and so i was no longer an outsider at all where do you think the feelings of being an outsider come from? I, I mean, is part of it growing up in a kind of remote place like Australia, where the center of the world, whether you wanted it to be or not, is is London or something like that, or British culture? Well, or, well, that, that's a, that's certainly. I mean, I, I think we affect we affect these things right. too when we we're young. It's just mm -hmm. kind of cooler, right? You know, when you're a young person to be sort of the the people that you admire and all of these right. sort of so these weird kind of mysterious yeah. peripheral sort of characters um but we also were australian mm. and we did come to britain and we were looked at with huge sort of suspicion yeah <laughs> by everybody in a way um we we did this weird kind of music Pe people but people would write articles about you know, this is the birthday party yeah. that that our music we, we'd gotten we'd gotten our rhythms from the from the Aboriginals and stuff right. stuff. You know that we were incredibly bizarre sort of. Right. Um, we, you know, we were certainly seen as and cultivated a kind of. Was um, that liberating for you though? Too that you could. I mean, if you're on the outside, then you can kind of do whatever you, you want. You can do whatever you want. Right. Yeah. Um. And actually, when we did go over to Australia, uh, mm. over to London, it was sort of dead. Whatever was right. going on in the punk days, it yeah. sort of essentially died. And there was just a whole lot of, in our view, pretty horrible music right. that, that uh, a kind of shoegazing, sort of self-absorbed. What? Yeah. What is boring. that? What you disliked about it? That it was it was just self-indulgent or uh, self-obsessed? It was boring. You know, what, we we, yeah. we, were, we were kids. Growing up in Melbourne, getting mm -hmm. the new Musical Express, right. and sitting there like and looking at the back pages mm -hmm. and seeing of all the gigs we could go to, if only we were in, if only yeah. we were in London. Imagine right. what our lives would be like, you know. Yeah. And eventually, after some years, we managed to get flights and go to England. Yeah. And we, but when we got there, it had all, it had happened. Yeah. Do you feel mm. like it's always like that though? You're always coming to the party <laughs> late. So then, yeah. and that you then you decide like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna host the party. I want to make yeah, well, a party. It, it, it was a little bit like that. I mean, we, we did see, so th there, there, there was that, but we, there were certain bands in, in London that were huge, you know, like there was the pop group. Do you, do you, do you know the pop group? I don't. Uh, just this amazing kind of mad funk dub mm -hmm. sort of incredible band. And there was the fall. Yeah. You know, so the, these were sort of outsider yeah. B bands too and we got on really well with them but th there was a big sort of sludge in the middle that we had nothing to do with but there were also bands like the cramps that, mm -hmm. that came over right. and played in london and we saw them and that was yeah so th there were these sort of things saving things that we what could did you like into. about the cramps um you know i i i think that that as a you know i i stood at a, i went to a Cramps gig, and I'd really never seen anything yeah. like it. I, I, um, I mean, 
Lux walked onto stage. He just <laughs> hurled the microphone at the audience yeah. and sort of dived in before anyone had, right. you know, played a chord on their guitars or whatever. And it was just mayhem. It was just mm -hmm. mayhem, and it's deeply exciting, you know, to watch. And you know, how much, you know, there's the, obviously the Cramps have a, a kind of gothic sensibility, but a, a comic gothic yeah. on some level. What is the attraction of that? You 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 are one of the great goths of the world, <laughs> and it seems like the world has caught up. I always was amazed for. A while I lived in a, a small town in Ohio, and I was amazed in Walmart, everything is Gothic. Everything <laughs> is crosses and skulls, and it's like everybody is Gothic now. What What is the appeal of well, a- I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I, I ever felt that that's what I yeah. was. You know, the last thing I ever wanted to be called was Gothic, to be yeah. honest. Um, now, now I actually have an uh, affection for, right. for the Goths because they just never went away. Yeah. You know, and, and I often think that when the apocalypse happens, mm -hmm. there'll be the sort of cockroaches and the goths right. still sort of so what, I mean, inhabiting you, the world. You've always been interested in themes about darkness, about criminality, about sin, about death, yeah, and playing with despair. And that doesn't need to be a negative thing, right? Or 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 a pessimist. You know, it it doesn't mean that you don't do anything. That can actually be a spur to action. It seems. Yeah, I, I, I look, I, I think I was a narrative storyteller. I was mm -hmm. deeply influenced by American uh, folk music mm -hmm. of, of the, the idea of the murder ballad. Right. From an academic point of view, I, I love to, to write songs where there was a visceral, violent line that would just leap mm -hmm. out at you. Mm -hmm. um, all of this sort of stuff really excited me, that, that kind of the language of violence to, to use what I liked about those those murder ballads, the Amer American murder ballads, is that they had these deeply detailed, you know, I drug her by the yeah. hair and all right. of this sort of stuff. These deeply detailed, violent lines that just sat really uncomfortably mm -hmm. within the within a few, you know, the chords yeah. of a song. So I was trying to do that sort of stuff. I, I still do that to some degree, but. On, on on the one hand, I, you know, without sort of dismissing all of that sort of stuff, that was uh, an affectation mm -hmm. in the sense that I really didn't, um, I really didn't know what I was talking about right. to some degree. It was when my son died that I that I understood uh, mm. about what darkness. So you had been was. kind of play acting. At well, I mean, the darkness. I, I think or play acting's. A, maybe a bit disparaging okay you know i mean i think there was there was a true danger yeah. to what the to to what the 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 birthday party was doing and so right. forth but um i don't think i had any real understanding of of um the sort of precarious nature of what it was to be a human being mm -hmm. and so i could sort of play with these ideas a lot mm -hmm. more and and because I didn't feel much for humanity in general, mm -hmm. and and that ch that changed, you know. Um, was it changing before the death of your son? Well, uh, you, you know, when I look at it, I have a kind of story that plays out that I was this n nasty guy, and mm -hmm. then a terrible thing happened, and I turned into a kind of. A, a kind and compassionate individual. Right. I don't actually think that that's necessarily true. Um, I think I always, um, you know, I sort of felt something about our the sort of general condition of what it was mm -hmm. to be a human being. Um, I, I just was inarticulate about those sort yeah. of matters. Why do you think you find it um, uh, ready to? Or, or comfortable to tell that story of that you once were like this and then something it's, it's happens. Just, and it's just, I'm a storyteller. Yeah. It's neater, you know, it's needed mm -hmm. to speak that way. You know, my, my dear friend who died recently, Anita Lane, right. we were talking about this, the, of holding the world in, in contempt. And she said, mm -hmm. that's not true about you, for one thing. Mm -hmm. She said, you always loved your mother. Mm -hmm. She said, you know, and, it's funny, re recently um, someone unearthed this big wooden trunk of, uh, of, of, um, of stuff that my mother had kept, and in it there's like 
scores of letters that I wrote to my mother of three mm. or four pages long of me when I'm living in, in the most dire circumstances mm. in London, drugged out of my mind, right. but I'm still sitting there writing these <laughs> like schoolboy <laughs> letters to my mother. So, so you know, there was. it's mm. not like I was um, hated the world in that way. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Before we continue with the Reason interview, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Bank on Yourself, a retirement plan alternative. Most of us have been told that the only way to have enough money to retire is to put your life savings into a 401k or IRA and then bank on Wall Street. But if that were true, why do studies show the average American who follows that advice will outlive their savings by a staggering 10 years? It's time to get the truth and discover a better way to grow and protect your money. Bank on Yourself is the proven retirement plan alternative that banks and Wall Street are desperately hoping you never hear about. It gives you guaranteed predictable growth and retirement income. With Bank on Yourself, your plan doesn't go south when the markets tumble. It gives you control of your assets. You get access to your money for any purpose with no questions asked and no government penalties or restrictions on how much money you can take or when you can take it. Bank on Yourself also gives you peace of mind because you'll know the minimum guaranteed value of your retirement savings on the day you plan to tap into them and at every point along the way. Learn the secret to safely and predictably grow your wealth every single year, enjoy tax-free retirement income, and gain control of your money. Just go to bankonyourself.com slash word, and they'll send you a free report about the retirement plan alternative that lets you bypass banks and Wall Street and take back control of your financial future. That's bankonyourself.com slash word for your free report. Bankonyourself.com slash W-O-R-D. And now back to the Reason interview. Well, let's talk about the, the new record. Uh, Wild God uh, and the title track, you know, it it, uh, it immediately comes to line what is arguably your most famous lyric, which where you uh, in a previous song where you talk about you don't believe in an interventionist God, and then in the title track Wild God, which has been released, um, you talk about how we are all as gods. Um, is there a linkage there, and what what are you what are you hoping? for, you know, it's stupid to say, what are you hoping for with this record? But what, what is the sensibility or the vibe that you're putting out into the world? Well, um, when I listened to this record back, which was some months ago after it had been mastered, um, I did so with my, my usual sort of reticence and kind of waiting to hear nothing but a whole lot of mistakes and uh, as as you as you do when you listen back to your music, and I just sat there with a big smile on my face mm -hmm. because it it felt like I was listening to a bunch of people, and myself included, that were just in a uh, that were just in a kind of good place, and that it, it, it's a joyful it's a joyful record in yeah. my estimation of it joy, joy being a, in its way a form of suffering you could say or at least right. joy joy being something that understands jo joy is is an, an emotion that understands the nature of the world mm -hmm. i would say it under uh, it understand it it's it's something that leaps out of uh our kind of common suffering to something greater and it feels like mm. that is th this record in and of itself and also the songs within it mm. just keep doing this yeah. this sort of frog-like right. leap which uh, of course God. is one of the other great yeah. tracks on the record frogs yeah. which at the uh, red hand files you you know somebody writes in to say you know i really just don't understand what the fuck this song is about and then yeah. you say like well i'll you know, you should come up with your own interpretation, but here's mine. And you talk about that. And it does seem that the, you know, the suffering is a prelude to possible transcendence, that yeah. we are constantly yeah. moving up. It's, and, a, it's a necessary yeah. uh, pre prelude. Right. 
Do you feel that, uh, you know, the, this is, you know, the, the best art and, you know, in a lot of ways, I think, you know, rock music or, or pop music does it better than any other form where there's a personal thing going on in the, in the creator of the song or, or of the music, but then also the world. Are we, I mean, it, it does, you, on, on some level, are we, uh, you know, and when I say we, is the world ready to get back to looking upwards or, look, or for progress after things like COVID and a number of unfolding problems now? I mean, that's... The, the, well, it's a good question. I, I wonder if we can ever really shake uh, what, what seems to become... Um, it seems to be sort of bred into the bone, of, bred into the blood of the world mm. is a deep dissatisfaction, uh, contempt for the world itself mm. and for ourselves as human being beings. I, I find that this is a sort of pr prevailing message of pretty much everything all yeah. the time. Um, and Do you think it, it's it, getting worse over the past decade or so uh, I, I i i feel that there, there there is a sort of subterranean movement towards more spiritual matters mm -hmm. i've noticed i've noticed i can have conversations about religion mm -hmm. even like christianity and stuff mm -hmm. like this at at a dinner table right that i couldn't have had 10 years ago without mm -hmm. just being laughed out of the room so i, I see that as a sort of move in a positive direction personally mm -hmm. um but i i think there there is a prevailing attitude in the world of of um, of cynicism mm. um, for what it is to be to be a human being that we we can only do we can only do ill to the world uh, and a, and a kind of lack of um, v finding any sort of value in mm. things and you know I know I sound like some old man kind of moaning yeah. on about things but it it, it feels um but what's interesting is to, you're you're saying i mean you're actually optimistic or forward looking whereas the the typical old man shouting at clouds is that oh things were so much better in london in the early 80s or something yeah. like that you're actually not saying that i i i, I i'm not i i have a um i think it's a kind of indulgence that we can't uh, uh, you know aff afford to entertain in the way that we do mm. um personally controversially mm. i see the world as sort of systemically beautiful mm. um and um and uh, that 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 it is broken and it's faulty and it's unjust mm. but at the same time it has immense value and that we need to look to that uh, rather than sort of leaning back into our sort of cynicism yeah. and uh, and and outrage, you know, that that we need to do better than that. Mm. You know, you've talked in uh, recent years at uh, the Red Hand Files about uh, how things like Antifa you know, and ultra political correctness or wokeness, or, you know, there's a kind of nihilism there. Um, and you stand athwart that. I mean, that's the act of artistic creation, right? That you can make something, you can see something beautiful in the world and make something beautiful. What do you think is driving a kind of broad-based uh, cultural pessimism? It seems particularly in the West, places like uh, England, um, certainly many places in the United States where people, if they look forward, they can only see things getting worse. They only see chaos. Uh, they only see environmental degradation and uh, things like that. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure what's driving it. I, I think that social media has a lot to do with it. I think the media in general has a lot to do with it. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how to answer that question, but but I do feel from from my own point of view that that from where I I, I feel I have I would say um, a kind of conservative temperament, mm -hmm. not that I'm politically conservative, but 
that I just have a fundamental understanding of the nature of loss. Mm. And that's what worries me most of all, in a way, is, is, that, is that it is so much easier to tear stuff down and very difficult to build it back. And, and so, I, so there's a sort of um, a soulful feeling mm -hmm. towards the world that I, that, I, that I think that we've lost. And, and part of that to me personally is at, at one of the things that that's attached to for me is, is the sort of secular or, or that, that, that we're losing the sort of avenues of meaning Mm -hmm. And that it's very difficult. If we don't love something, or if we don't feel any meaning in, in things, then why wouldn't yeah. we hold the world, look at the world cynically? And I think these avenues of meaning are being shut down. Like what, what's an example? Of uh, a religion yeah. is one, for example. Well, there, there was some, there, there is, the, my, my relation f for, with religion is it's a structural in institution where I can find meaning in things. I, I go to church um, and I have a place that where, where I can take my assorted sorrows. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what it's actually for and that it wraps its arms around that and, and, um, and allows me to find meaning in that. Mm -hmm. For example, now th this has largely been chopped away and we, we, you know this is seen as mostly um, or, or there's terrible um, variants on that that are just you know America's terrible in regard to its its sort of religious temperament you, you, it's, what do you mean well just just the kind of the sort of Christian right and mm -hmm. all of this sort of stuff and um, th that sort of American type of Christianity is mm -hmm. pretty hard to it yeah, did help it? give rise to the cramps, though, <laughs> yeah. for sure, right? Is right. that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you know what I mean yeah. by that. Um, so, you know, I, I think that there are different, there are different, even, even things like mm -hmm. music, if we're talking about mm -hmm. music, the, the idea that um, music is a genuinely transformative, trans sort of transporting um, thing is is being looked at with cynicism as well. Mm -hmm. We have like AI that is that it is um, has has sort of song generating mm -hmm. things where you only have to put in a prompt and a pretty good song pops mm -hmm. out, right? I don't know if you've if you've done that, if yes, you've tried that. Of course. You know, and, and mm -hmm. it's pretty good. Yeah. It's the first iteration. It's better than anything I would do. So yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and, and you know, it's as, as good as anything do. on the radio. Yeah. and it's 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 right. its first attempt. And in in a year or two years' time, right. we're going to be able to go straight to the product, and it's going to be indistinguishable about between yeah. anything I can do or right. Nirvana can do or anybody yeah. else can do, right? Um, and this is to me uh, an idea uh, that that the creative struggle. Mm -hmm. which I, I think is the essence of meaning in this world, is seen as an impediment or, 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 yeah. a, or a, a kind of thing in the way to the product itself. Right. Why, why bother with, with having to mm. sit down and kind of do soul searching and find out what sort of song you want to do or, mm -hmm. or go into a studio with your friends and try and create some sort of music? Why do we need that when we have the... This product, right. you just drop out of this thing, and what scares me most of all is—I I know I'm kind of ranting now, but <laughs> whatever. <laughs> what scares me most of all is that we we are living in a society that is so demoralized mm. that actually we don't really care. Mm. You know, there's a lot of people that say, "Yeah, but we we value true human art and mm. and performance and all that sort of stuff." But I don't know. I think we can quite easily get to a place where no one cares one way or the other, mm -hmm. and so we're just losing these avenues for legitimate, transcendent. Experiences. And you you find that religion or church uh, essentially? Uh, I, I find that. Yeah, I find that, that personally. That kind of gives you a space to kind of think about that and confront that and to process. You talking about for church yeah. for me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I find. 
I find for myself, I don't, I don't necessarily think that this is right for everybody, and right. nor is every church as good right. as every other church. Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure, right? But I, I think if you can find a, a, a find a place that 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 sort of somehow creates a meaningful experience, mm -hmm. which I, I actually have in and, London. And is that going back to where you raised what Anglican or whatever yeah, the Australian? I'm, 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 an, I'm and, an Anglican, so so I'm, so it's kind of it's something that has always been in your life. You've talked in in the past yeah. about you would go to church and then you might go get heroin afterwards, but church was always on the the kind of <laughs> yeah. calendar, right? Yeah, I mean, off and on, but yeah. for sure. Yeah, I was always trying. I was always giving it a go. Yeah. Um, and not not exceeding and and, mm. and finding most of the time I was just in church and, and hugely embarrassed mm -hmm. about the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I, I don't feel that way anymore, although, it, once again, that really depends on the church you're going to. How but, much of not being embarrassed is because you're older and you don't, you don't care what other people think as much. There, there, there is that, and you know, I mean, uh, the church I go to is the music is so beautiful, mm -hmm. the organist is so insanely good <laughs> uh, that that it's very difficult to hold your shit together. You know, when this yeah. music starts going on, and it, you, you see everyone's just yeah. deeply, deeply moved by the whole thing. The church I go to, which I'm not going to tell you what it is because mm. I want to be able to go there on my own. Right. They call it the, <laughs> the they call it the church for atheists. Yeah, because because it's just on on every level right. extraordinarily beautiful experience. So, and you're not necessarily talking, you know, theologically here. It well, is I, like I, a time. I mean, I have place, my feelings but, there too. What sure. is that then? Is it? I mean, you seem. I've been thinking of uh, you know. I mean, this shows through in your work, but also in interviews. Um, you've talked a lot over the years about how Johnny Cash and Bob Dylan have been very important. They Cash was very much of a Christian, yeah, um, and of the sort that you were kind of eh, I'm not too sure about, right? The, uh, kind of Southern Baptist. Dylan obviously went through a phase where he was on fire for evangelical yeah. Christianity. Uh, Leonard Cohen, another huge, you know, yeah. uh, kind of influence on you, spiritual if not Christian. Um, what is yeah? What is your religion? Uh, you know, what well, is well, your religion? Well, for, for, <laughs> for me, the the problem with all of those people, to yeah. some degree, and why why I'm, I don't I feel quite separate from them. Yeah, uh, not Leonard Cohen. I mm -hmm. would say he has a much more ambiguous mm -hmm. uh, relationship with re religion. I would have thought, um, not knowing him, but yeah. what I what, what I get from his stuff is that these people, you know, the, the, these these. Bob Dylan at that time had arrived somewhere, yeah, and and certainly Johnny Cash, it's, there's not there's no sort of uncertainty right. about it, and and I I feel that I believe uh, I feel that I exist in a place that's somehow sort of in between belief and mm. and skepticism, shall yeah. we say? This sort of very um, uh, full. Uh, it's, it's a. It's a. It's a place full of potential where the imagination is quite free to roam around. It's. It's not locked into sort of s certainty about right. things. It's not atheistic in its mm -hmm. its thing. You know. I, I mean, ultimately, I feel like I'm a like I'm a believer amongst unbelievers and, and a kind of an unbeliever amongst believers. Right. That's how it tends to feel because there's a sort of lovely push and pull yeah. in that area so i'm sort of um embedded within the religious right. experience but not uh like a paid up that definitely you know. comes through in the in wild god i mean the whole album it seems yeah. like that it's i mean literally it's not literally figuratively it seems like the songs are trying to achieve escape velocity from the planet and they you kind of push up and then come back down to yeah. earth and things like that it's this it's the leap of the frog yeah absolutely. You know, with its little hands yeah ex uh, fingers extended you know do you feel i mean to be a bit more optimistic about things you're in a, in a way you have never been more popular or more present as a figure on um i would say on 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 a kind of like musical stage or on a on a world yeah. stage it seems like that the yearning that you're articulating is widespread and kind of acknowledged by people. I, I think it's 
like, like I said before, um, you know, I, I think people are, are less embarrassed about um, talking about these sort of feelings of uh, these yeah. particular needs, spiritual needs mm -hmm. or religious needs, in, in fact. Um, I've, I've just noticed that. Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've had people say, hey, can I come along with you to church? Yeah. You know, I mean, and I'm like, yeah, sure, <laughs> if you want. <laughs> Uh, do you, uh, where does your belief, one of the things that uh, really strikes me as in increasingly unique about you, and it, this depresses me because more artists aren't like this, you absolutely defend the right to free expression and to thought. You know, um, this is a regular uh, feature in, in the Red Hand Files, uh, but where you say you're not going to apologize for past songs where there are lyrics which are now no longer you know, politically correct or whatever you want to say, or that are offensive. Um, but you're also not glorying in that. You're, but you talk a lot about the, the attempts to shut down kind of free speech and free expression, even or especially in the, in the artistic fields is insane. Um, where does that belief come from? And why do you think that seems to be less kind of front and center among creative people these days? Yeah, I mean, it's this, this is changing. This, no. this is a conversation that feels kind of retro to some degree. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think people just got sick of it. And I think people, in the end, don't like art that's like that they, mm. they don't they want art to be challenging and interesting yeah. and and confronting and, and offensive you know mm. and outrageous and yeah. these sorts of things i think people just basically most people want want that mm. you know and i think this idea that there's a generation who don't i don't really buy that in a mm. way and you know, I also don't really buy. I mean, I I know the the, the idea that you can't say things and stuff mm. like that. I think is a feels kind of kitsch mm -hmm. or something like that. You know, when people say that sort of stuff, in the sense that you know what what you're doing, what the the, the whole podcast world, mm -hmm. the whole online world, is just full of people having right. like these so called dangerous conversations, right? Yeah. right? Um, so in that respect, free speech is alive and well. Um, but I think in regard to music, the tide, the tide mm. has moved out. It was just a kind of, it was just a sort of dumb yeah. period. Um, and the people in the end don't like bad art. Right. You know, they like art that, challenges you and so you know, that somebody sort of troubles like, the water a little bit right so like uh, kanye west whose latest record is filled with various kinds of anti-semitic and misogynist tropes if it's good music people are still going to listen to it yeah i i un unfortunately i would say um i i think that it doesn't really matter if people uh mm -hmm. anti-semitic Actually, right. I think that's not one of the things that people are particularly worried right. about. Yeah, I would yeah, say, yeah. Um, unfortunately, mm. and and I don't. It's it's not the part of Kanye that I, you know, yeah. I don't go to his records because they're anti-Semitic, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I go to Kanye's records, um, some of Kanye's records, because he's doing some of the most interesting music right. I've ever heard, and. His gospel mu music, yeah. I don't know what the impulse behind oh, you must that love is. That, right? It's extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, I've never, never heard gospel music like yeah. that. I listen to quite a lot of gospel music. Yeah. I've never heard anything like that in my life. It's pure, pure brilliance yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Deeply catchy mm -hmm. um, and musically extraordinarily beautiful yeah. stuff. So. You know, Kanye is is uh, like like many great artists, a sort of broken, fucked up individual. Yep. Mm. Um, but I always, I'm not worried by. I'm always encouraged by humans that can create beautiful things 
mm. yet B, these right. broken into it, like it's the distance traveled between what they are capable of creating, right. the awesome nature of their art, and the sort of fucked up nature of their personalities. It, it, this sort of journey is something to be celebrated. Yeah. You know, it's not, we don't get rid of the beautiful stuff in order to punish, we don't, we don't get rid of the best of us right. in order to punish the worst of us, if, if that makes any yeah, sense. Totally. Does, it doesn't make sense at all to me. I, I mean, it, it, you know, I mean, I, I don't like, I, I, I have a particular problem with anti-Semitism. Yeah. I, I, I don't what, like What it. does that uh, stem from? I, and I, I realize just, that's a ridiculous question to be asking. Yeah. What, you know, what, you know, what is wrong with Why are you so anti-anti-Semitic? But why is anti-Semitism a particular issue? I, I think concern? it's a little bit like we were talking about before uh, when you were talking about it, the Anglican Anglican mm -hmm. religion. It's from my childhood mm -hmm. as as th this this has always been my religion. Yeah. So I've not been interested in other religions. It's mm -hmm. just been the one I'm happy with. And I think as a child, uh, I was raised in Melbourne. I was just grew up in Jewish areas. Mm -hmm. I was surrounded by Jewish people. Yeah. I knew many, many Jewish people. Um, I, my, my first girlfriend for three years was a Jewish girl. Mm. Uh, you know, I just have a relationship with Jewish people right. um, that, you know, so it's, it's, it's kind, of, kind of a personal thing and, mm. It's it's weird because th there's also the sort of biblical element. I, I was really fascinated by the Bible as mm -hmm. a young person, you know. And when I left Australia, it wasn't it wasn't to get to England, mm. and it wasn't even to get to America. <laughs> I wanted to get to Israel because because this is where all this stuff happened. Right. Yeah, you know, like this is I could stand on the Sea of Galilee yeah. and I could go to where Christ was so, supposedly right. crucified and. Yeah. You know, this was extraordinarily exciting for me, and and this this is you know, regardless of all the horrific complications mm -hmm. that are going on in Israel at the moment, deep down I I, I have a sort of a, a abiding love for that um, place, yeah. you know, and so and you know, let alone the the history of the Jewish people, right. of course. What mm -hmm. I mean, what do you? Uh, you, you I just want to alert you now. I've done like <laughs> six radio interviews in in a row. Right. So if I'm sounding a little bit sort of hysterical no, and, no. And, and sort of rambling, it might be. Uh, uh, I was going to say, you know, you have over the years and at, at various points, you've pushed back against people, and you know, I'm thinking Roger Waters, uh, Brian Eno, who have tried to shame you for performing in Israel. Um, you know, where, where does the, that kind of mentality come from? And these are people of incredible talent and who pushed, you know, they enlarged what was possible in popular music or in music as well as creative expression. And to, you know, what, what does it feel like when people like that are saying, no, you should not be doing that because that artist that, you know, should not be allowed. As an artist, you should not be going to how, how does it feel yeah. for me? Well, I mean, there's obviously larger issues, you know, and it's not about me. Mm. Um, I I just feel, you know, and I'm no uh, friend of the government of Israel, mm. um, but I, I just feel on some level that I find it difficult to come to terms with using my music in order to punish ordinary people because of the acts of their government. Mm. You know, I, I, it, it sort of comes down to that to some degree. Um, where it comes from for people like, mm. you know, these are, these are different people. Right. Brian Eno is a different kettle of fish to Roger Waters. <laughs> you know, Roger Waters, I think, is deeply damaging to the to the sort of boycott movement. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, an, it's embarrassing. Yeah. Um, Brian Eno is a different yeah. character. He's just thoughtful individual. Do you, were you a big Pink Floyd fan at any point? Yeah, when, when I was yeah. growing up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, their early stuff for sure. What, what, is, what does it feel like to, you know, both be acknowledged by one of your musical heroes, but then to be disparaged by them? 
that's a, a kind of interesting two step. Um, I wasn't that much. Of a fan. <laughs> 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 well, you know, I mean, I, I was a big fan of, of, of British progressive music. I yeah. loved all that sort of, that yeah. stuff, you know, so. What did you like about that? Is it, is um, it that it's... Well, it was my, my, my brother. I had an older yeah. brother who, who listened to all that sort of stuff. So I yeah. grew up on loving the music yeah. that he did. And then, then I found the Stooges and, yeah. and MC5 <laughs> and so forth. And that sort of music took a back step. But I, I really go back to that music right. these days, like King Crimson and stuff like yeah. that. But, yeah, it, it, was, a, it was... I mean, it, the, the thing is we don't really get much shit about that sort of thing these days. I mean, I think the BDS mm-hmm. essentially works on the fact that if if they if you're going to play mm-hmm. Israel and you and they come down hard and you mm-hmm. don't, it's a win. If you do play Israel, they they basically leave you alone because mm-hmm. it's Are there any countries that you wouldn't play? Um what Historically, oh, I don't know. You know yeah, I, mean, I, I was I thinking can't, now. I can't yeah. speak it, but n- now I yeah. don't know. I'd have to. Uh, yeah, I guess if you got an offer to play in the Cavern Club in 1942, that's a yeah, different story. Yeah, then, yeah. you know, I mean, obviously. So, I, I don't know. I'd have to sort of think about that. I can't. N- nothing's sort of jumping at me, right? Um, you know, I don't. I I don't like. I, I don't. Personally, I know, look, I understand that this is a controversial thing to say and uh, I just don't agree with a cultural boycott mm-hmm. in general. I mean, there, mm-hmm. are time, there are places where it's worked, I think, mm-hmm. mostly because it doesn't even work. Yeah. I mean, clearly, it's not working, right. you know, in, in Israel at the moment. Mm-hmm. It, it, I, I think it, in my view, it it sort of emboldens the very worst aspects mm-hmm. of the current government um, that it, it, it sort of they, they, they sort of exploits that they, they exploit the sort of isolationist no. thing like the whole world is against us right you know no no one will come and play uh, which which just I don't know the I think that it's it's used to to further mm. their nefarious ag- agendas yeah. um and, and at the same time punishing ordinary mm-hmm. fans but that's sort of i think how i feel i mean there's it's awful what is going on over there and you know um but i i just don't i don't feel comfortable with with that I, I know after this, uh, the red hand file inbox mm. is going to be, you know, <laughs> a, a swamp of abuse and stuff like that. But anyway, um, what do you think? It's, of- it's actually why I don't yeah. really speak about this sort of stuff. Yeah, is because I'm trying to protect the red hand files, and <laughs> the red hand files is a very very beautiful thing. Yeah, but it's vulnerable, and it's vulnerable to. Um, kind of abuse. Mm. Um, Do you, you, you obviously started in Australia, you moved to London, and then after the death of your son, you lived in Los Angeles for a while, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you didn't much care for Los Angeles. No, I loved, I loved, oh, well, I love yeah. it, Los Angeles. I what still you, love it. Yeah. Angeles. What did you like about it? I, I went, when I, Went there, uh, you know. I have a bunch of friends there, and uh, we kind of we we had this thing going. Really, it's about ten of us, really interesting people, and we would sort of meet every weekend, mm. sit around a table, eat, and and sort of talk about stuff. Mm. It was it was really quite a beautiful time. Mm. Um, and all these sort of, you know, it was really rich, creative place. Mm. Uh, and it was sort of sunny all the time and and kind of distracting from the sort of woes me and Susie were mm-hmm. carrying around with each other, were ca- carrying around. Um, it, was a, so it was a beautiful experience. But then sort of COVID happened and we mm. went back to, to Brighton. And, 
Yeah. Did you, your mother died during COVID and yeah. you were not able to no. attend to her. No. Um, how does, how did that make you um, feel about kind of the way COVID was handled? Um, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't fly to Australia. Mm. Um, I, and and I think even if I did, it was difficult to go to the into the hospital. Mm -hmm. So I, I watched my mother die by Zoom, mm. you know, and uh, by my sisters. My sister was allowed in by by iPad, and then the, the, then by her iPad, and then there mm. was a a um, a, a funeral which my son. Earl Grimley called a zoomeral mm. because only six people were allowed into the church mm. and everyone else had to sit out in the car park. Uh, and I, I could watch on this, on what was happening on the mm. screen. So on some level, it was deeply, deeply distressing. Mm. But, but at the same time, I, I didn't, uh, at that point for me, the jury was still out on, mm -hmm. on whether the lockdowns were a, a good thing yeah. or a bad thing. And I don't really have anything to say about that one way or the mm. other. Um, mostly because my own personal experience of of COVID was so positive in the sense that I I, I had a year off. Yeah, I I was could spend it with my wife. My son came. Mm. Earl came to live with us. Um, it was a it was a sort of richly creative time. Mm. It was just, it was a very strange thing because I was living in in Brighton. Um, facing the sea and, and it was a, the sort of summer and the spring mm. and I was sitting on the balcony behind me was the hospital mm. that was piling up with mm. you know corpses right. you know so it was a it was a really weird troubling sort of but creative times so. yeah anyway I, I'm, I'm not really I don't have much to say about COVID one way mm. or the other really was, do you see that, you know, so, I mean, that it's horrible to be away from your a loved one when they're dying, but on another level, to be able to kind of be present is an odd moment uh, in humanity, right? What, because of technology, technology or whatever? Yeah. Right? yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure. I, I, you know, my, the final memory I have of my mother is a sort of glitching mm -hmm. um, uh, sort of picture on a small screen, yeah. you know, and, and I'm not sure whether there's much, was much uh, yeah. advantage in that. And, and I, I really only found out how I felt about that whole thing when I finally got to go to Australia. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was quite emotional to do that. Yeah. Um, as a, a Final question, I guess. Um, it, right now, England is going through, you know, a particularly uh, a violent moment. There are riots in London, I guess, and other places. The government is talking about um, shutting down certain types of social media or certain types of speech. You know, does that kind of uh, action worry you? And if so, how how does it? Yeah, I mean, it that it it does worry me. Although I think these platforms are toxic as anyway. I'm, mm -hmm. not, I'm not. I don't have much love for, for these right. platforms. So, you know, they shut down Twitter altogether. I'm not going to lose a, a lot of mm. s sleep over it. But uh, 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 as a sort of free speech issue, I, yeah. I think. People should be allowed, you know. I, I mm. basically think more speech is better than less right. speech. Um, so, but I, I, I find social media, um, for other reasons, enormously problematic. It is that because it it flattens and falsifies interactions with people, or yeah, it it, it completely destroys the idea of nuance and mm -hmm. and any conversation whatsoever um from a personal level i used to go on on twitter and i 
just to sort of follow it. I, I never participated. I was mm. just sort of, you know, I, I couldn't. I, I, I didn't. I don't think I could see one person that I loved, you know, and admired, <laughs> not be, you know, completely diminished by the form yeah. itself. Mm. You know. I said I had one last question, but this <laughs> is the actual final question, which is: uh, you are. Uh, in a, you're in an industry where people are not known for aging well, um, you know, and you are uh, almost three three times past the 27 club and things like that. <laughs> what is your secret? Because this is also where you know I think you've tapped into, or you you've you're kind of vibrating like different things that are going on, and you know, uh, over over the over your career. But one of them is like you are. You seem to be aging backwards. Uh, you're both your creativity, uh, your physical appearance, and things like that. Yeah, what what you know, is the twenty I mean, years of drug addiction and a yeah. good face cream? Okay, yeah. <laughs> so it's basically la laying off the drugs helps. Uh, look, uh, I, I won't go. I, 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 I won't really go into that. But be, if, uh, sure, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think you're talking about other things, right? Are you just yeah. talking about the physical? No, my, I'm not my... just talking about the physical. I mean, it, I guess it ties back into your relationship of you opening yourself up. Is that part of uh, like yeah, the de-aging Yeah, I, 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 think, I think there's a whole um, raft of things that I'm interested in doing mm -hmm. that, that just keep, keep me uh, alive and keep mm -hmm. me engaged in the world in different sorts of ways. Um, and I, f I feel old and sort of bold, I would say, in the sense that um, I feel the the world has had its taken its best shot, mm. um, and that I that I'm I'm not kind of worried about uh, how I'm perceived mm. in the same way as I may have been worried, say, ten years ago, or more careful about mm. the way. So this frees you up to all sorts of things. Um, so I feel very free in the world, um, and it, it's funny. I, I've, I've talked to a lot of a lot of people have said this to me, but that have lost people in in the same way as that. Mm. You just it just doesn't matter. Things just don't matter in the same way. Mm. Um, what can really happen to you um, that that is of any true? You, you know, I don't know. I, I just feel sort of creative and um, sort of bold to do whatever I want to mm. do. And I think old age tends to sort of shut you down. Mm. It can shut you down. Um, you know, and it, each project is kind of exciting. So I'm looking forward in a weird way to make another record. Mm -hmm. I have some ideas about that. And... Um, these things are not, these things are invigorating. Hmm. Does that sound right? <laughs> that sounds very good to me. Uh, Nick Cave, thanks for All talking right. to Reason. It's been a pleasure. Th thanks, thanks, Nick.